right. Uh, good morning. Happy Tuesday. Uh, sorry for my stream difficulties yesterday. It seemed like we were having kind of internet difficulties. My wife, who also was doing stuff at the same time as me, also said that she had poor internet connectivity. Hopefully, we do not have that today. Uh, I wish it was. Wish we were coming to you with something uh, less depressing, I guess. But we've lost another legend of classic D and D classic role playing, and that was James Ward, who I didn't see exactly the date passed away, but uh, within the last, I guess, week or so, I'm not sure. Uh, Wikipedia doesn't have a a, a a specific date; just says March. But he passed away, and I know he had I know he had some illness issues, but still it. Things, uh, but I thought you know I'd use it uh, much like with the Janelle uh, Jacques one. Use it as an opportunity to kind of memorialize them, these individuals who meant so much for the hobby by reading something they wrote. This is Metamorphosis Alpha. I think this is the first edition. Pretty sure it is. I have it somewhere. It's in a box. Uh, my it, it's it's a it's in a uh, the original. It's in like a soft cover here. I just happen to have this handy. Look at kind of. Ready reference sheets, kind of thing. Similar, I don't know, letter size, staple bound. Book, I think, I don't know if it was the first sci fi RPG, tabletop RPG, certainly one of the first, if not the one. Hey, Kabuki Kid, welcome. Thanks for hanging out. Muzzle Paint says, uh, The Mutant King is dead, RIP. Yep. And we're going to see a lot of <laughs> mutation stuff, which is one of the things when I, when I first looked at these rules, I just thought was amazing was the kind of mutant stuff. Okay, Kabuki Kid says, pretty sure it's the first. Yeah, maybe there's one out there that's earlier. I don't know. This is pretty early. Also, I believe served as the basis for Gamma World, uh, in, in at least in many ways, if not in most ways. But the uh, the story behind Metaformers Alpha, well, I guess let's just read into it, and uh, and, and we'll, we'll see it. But uh, we're on a generational ship, I believe, is, if I'm recalling correctly. That's kind of the setup for this. But let's let's get on in it. Um, I don't know if I would count Tecamel as being sci-fi. I good question. Don't know. It doesn't matter overly much. I don't. I suppose. Okay, so here we have a forward from uh, Gary Gygax and Brian Bloom. Metamorphosis Alpha is one of the first one of the new breed of role-playing games. It is designed such that the referee and players will develop their own quote-unquote game world as they go along. Metamorphosis Alpha plays much like a good science fiction book reads. Each player takes the role of a person, humanoid mutation or creature mutation on a vast radiation-ridden starship which is out of control in deep space. Radiation has caused all knowledge to be quote-unquote lost and humans are in a state of semi-barbarism. Players must learn, must learn to survive in a world of fantastic mutations and hostile radiation using only their natural cunning and sophisticated space equipment as they can find and learn to use. That's pretty awesome uh, little write-up. I mean, it certainly makes me want to play it. I'm not going to read the rest of this. I, you know, I'm going to be try to be selective so I can hopefully get this done in a reasonable amount of time. So if I miss something, let me know. Obviously, if you let me know afterwards, that doesn't help too much. But if you're in here live, then you know, let me know. I can try to go back and pick stuff out. This is 1976 TSR rules, and then this is a, I believe, a version. I'll see from drive through. I forget exactly where, but this one, 2007. But I think this is just a straight print port of the first edition. Table of contents, great, great, great. Let me know about the type. I probably will zoom in somewhat. It's even easier for me to read. I do have my glasses perched on my head, but even then, but you know these these game books, these game books back then, man, they really were. They wanted to really cram ram the uh the content in there so the type gets rather small so let me know if i can help zoom in i mean i'm not trying to give everyone like a, you know a point by point pixel pixel perfect version of the game of the screens but um, still let me know if it's too small and this is just some clean hopefully <laughs> hopefully it's clean clean ice water for the working man okay the muzzle paint Yep, confirms for me that yeah, Gamma World was uh, capitalization of Metamorphosis Alpha to move into a more expansive open world setting. Yep, and I think Gamma World takes place, I think it's like the East Coast or, or just the continental United States, I think is what that map is, if I remember. <laughs> now, if we get talking that you can see here the number of, number of participants, one referee and two to 24 players. Yeah, and, and uh, 
I mean, look, I've heard tales at, at various cons of some of these guys go, coming in a room and just playing with a bunch of folks and just working it, working the room, making it work. I'd love to be involved in one of those. I'd never have. 24 seems like a lot, but maybe it can be managed. Certainly, I think I'd go for a more modest number if I were, if I were, if I don't know, 19, if I was, I don't know how, well, I was, I was, I was born, but I wasn't very, I was, I was, I was very young. I was like a toddler at the time. So I, I'm trying to think of what age I would have been where I would have looked at that and said, oh yeah, two to 24, let's do it. It's like I get my whole you know, fifth grade class involved. But I suppose if you're adults running in kind of a club, you could probably figure out. That's a lot. Okay. We have an intro here. Mankind's urge to explore and expand its frontiers finally caused another push into the vastness of space, first planetary, then interstellar. By the 23rd century, a great migration wave was spreading from old Terra to the hundreds of inhabitable worlds that had been discovered in the Milky Way galaxy. During the next hundred years, colonization ships of all kinds and descriptions went out to the stars bearing seedling colonies seeking a better life. Many found their new homes, for better or for worse. But for one reason or another, scores of these starships never reached their destination. This game is based on just such an event, the fate of a colony ship that became lost. Which is a great intro. I feel like there's, has there been some science fiction? I know there's been stuff written about these kind of ships getting lost. But I wonder, I don't know, in 76, I'm sure there's been stories. I'm trying to think if there's a movie. I mean, I would, I would go, the thing, the one that comes to mind is Planet of the Apes. Just in terms of astronauts going out and kind of landing somewhere that's supposed to but this game isn't really about landing anywhere i believe everything takes place on the ship and it's been a quite a while since i've read through here that's why i say believe to be we'll we'll get things confirmed or uh or or, or, or facts reestablished as we go through disaster some one third of the way to the planetary destination that had been selected for warden stretched the very fringe of a cloud of space radiation this cloud had been charted and analyzed so that warden's captain was aware that he was to plot a course to avoid any possible danger. Somehow the vessel came too close to the radiation and the cloud contained disaster. The energy given off at the fringes of the celestial hazard was foreign to all previously known radiation types. It passed through every one of the ship's protection systems and defensive and defense screens. The effects on the ship itself were startling. The worst hit were the colonists aboard, and most of the human beings exposed to the radiation simply turned to piles of calcium with no advanced sim symptoms. Well, that's one <laughs> that's one way to go. Hard hit were also the flora and fauna that underwent mutation, if even if they even survived at all. Even some of the vessel's systems were affected, and unstable radioactive areas were caused from the death from the clouds' radiation. The humans who survived the initial exposure discovered too late that life forms in their natural settings, such as the ecologically prepared forest areas and the like, seemed to have the greatest resistance to the effects of the radiation. A few of the crew and colonists then took to living in the huge parks of Warden. A handful remained who tried to restore sanity in order to the starship. They failed. Bum, bum, bum. And so, you know, I'm getting, again, I'm breezing through this, but, you know, we're getting a great idea of kind of what sort of things are going to be happening in this game. We have some suggested additional equipment. Random number generator. Oh, it's okay, dice. <laughs> oh, they got dice also. Hold on, what do they say here? Random number generator. Random numbers can be generated by means of small electronic calculator by drawing numbered chips from a container, by selecting cards from packets of specially selected playing cards, etc. Okay, and then they say simplest to do a percentile dice. Because I was gonna say, like, this is pretty early to be calling for. I suppose if you I suppose depending on what you're where you were in life and if you might have had cal I don't know what I'm trying to think like calculators, but what calculators had random number generators? Did they have them? Because I I I'm, I guess they must have some of them. And okay, some dice, some graph paper, hex paper, sheet protectors. Gotta have your sheet protectors, some notebooks, pencil and paper, your imagination, and one very patient referee. And players, hey, the more the merrier. Bring them on. Wookie Kid says, uh, Metamorphosis Alpha is an infamously deadly game. So I guess that number would drop fairly quickly as you went. Well, I hopefully, the, hopefully the players aren't dying. Hopefully just their character's going and you're recouping them. It might make for a fun, I could see how that might end up that you have 24 and then some of them are dead and creating new characters and then you're figuring out where they're coming in. So maybe you end up having pods of different things and then, oh, you're getting more people and then some people die, some people come in. I don't know. We'll see. It's kind of one of those things I'd love to try uh, to, to do is just, yeah, let's bring in, let's bring in as many people as we can and try to run this thing and see what it's like. Maybe there'd be a way to do it. I feel like. Something like, I mean, in person would obviously be optimum, but 
I wonder if they want to be something fun to do on Discord or Zoom or something. I don't think I have enough people on my Discord to actually get a full game of this going. Which means, join the Discord. Uh, let's see. What do you got here? So the starship. The gigantic starship Warden is ellipsoidal in shape, being approximately 50 miles long at its extremes, 25 miles wide, and 8.5 and miles tall, with an additional half-mile high dome on the top of the ship. The ship is divided into 17 levels or decks. Okay, the floors between the levels are each approximately 330 feet thick. It's kind of funny, because I feel like a lot of this stuff isn't really that important, but they give it to us anyway. I mean... Presumably, you know, given what we're going to be doing and giving our, like some of these things, it's almost like it's like the, the the levels of a mega dungeon kind of thing. But, you know, you're floating around. Kabuki Kid says, I know that they know that Jim Ward would run con games and apparently would sometimes have a TPK almost immediately. He would wave his hand and say it was all a dream and do a reset and keep going. I mean, that's a great way to go, right? It's almost like, oh, you TPK in the first room. It's like you guys all wake up. You know, you had some kind of. Uh, you know, I mean, depending on the game in a sci-fi game, it could just be a dream. It could be like your gods have warned you. Don't don't go into that room like that. It was, you know, like a, a prophetic dream. All right. So the following descriptions of the levels and what they look, what they contain are intended only as examples. OK, so we don't need to take these as written necessarily. So level one example level 31 by 13 by quarter miles. I love the specificity of these things. Probably would. I can't imagine that would actually come up very much. Whoops. Didn't mean to, whoops, didn't mean to switch up. Okay. This level is filled with supplies destined to be used on the colony planet. There are gigantic stacks of raw materials, refined metals, plastics, glass, emergency food rations, et cetera, et cetera. Ramps and catwalks connect the stacks. Robots are usually used to pick up the needed supplies. There is a large reinforced pressure hatch on one side of the hull for on-planet removal of supplies from this level. Entrance to this level is by the main elevators and four inclined planes or spiral ramps leading down to level two. Access to this level is gained only through use of the command or security. I'm probably not going to read all these levels. What's level two is more storage, but more finished stuff as opposed to raw materials in level one. Level three, more supplies. Level four, mothballed factories. Basically, again, stuff that's for planets, planetary use. These are surrounded by an uninhabited wilderness forest area. Although there are no human settlements in the forest, the area abounds with forest animals that live among the deciduous trees and conifers. The area has a number of forest-type ecology robots that operate in the forest, and human visitors visit the area on occasion for camping and wilderness outings. Well, you know, you want to you go on a nice outing. Do a little camping, why not? Oh, uh, what was that? Level, that was level four, level five. We've got more factories and some grasslands. Level, whoops, level six. Engineering and ecology looks like more labs, laboratories, working metal working shops, refineries. There is also some mixed forest. Kind of an interesting take that they mixing up the different usage is kind of cool. I don't know that I, I feel like I would want my labs and stuff just isolated, just because I would be afraid of some kind of contamination if something bad happened in the lab. Suddenly, your one of your ecological parks is right next to it. But maybe they're if they're studying the parks, then maybe it makes sense to have the laboratories nearby. Level seven, all rolling grasslands with some ranches and prairies. Groups of families live on the ranches, raise cattle. There are some, oh, there are some forest robots. There are some herds of animals, largely dry and, and uh, arid. Okay. Level eight is farmlands, rural farms, and villages. For those families who favor, oh, the chair, this chair is driving me nutso. Things I need, a new chair. Okay. For those families who favor the outdoor life. All right, that's nice. Nine, administrative security facilities, security systems, whatnot. Level 10, the control center, ship command. 11, forests, 12, jungles. The more supplies on 13, 14 is a city, 15 water stuff, 16 factories that are active, 17 engines, motors, dynamos, and the observation dome. Oh, we have like a little, 
got some nice little maps with sort of the basically the layouts looking down from above i would imagine and that's it cool i think that one of the neat things is that this kind of mirrors it's it what was i gonna say so in video games it's always it used to make me laugh i haven't it's been a while since i've played any serious video games but you know there was always the ice level the lava level the you just go through these different things like oh, okay they're gonna drop me off and it happens to be whatever all ice then lava then maybe something else and and, and we, from a video game standpoint, you kind of get it because they want to give you these different environments with different things, and they kind of want to make it a really bold changes in environment, right? So they don't, it doesn't get too samey. This interesting thing is because of the way this ship is, you kind of have that where you can have these things move up, and you don't have to necessarily go hundreds of miles to get to a new environment. You can literally just go up a couple levels in the elevator, and suddenly you're in. I didn't, I didn't see one that was particularly cold, but. You could turn one cold, or maybe I just missed it. But you can have these different environments kind of all next to each other. So you can have basically a, a, a cityscape, even kind of a modern cityscape, at least in terms of structures, and then just bop down, and then you're in grasslands, or you're in forest, or you're in a prairie you know, kind of thing. So it's kind of a neat way to be able to compress, I guess, a lot of things that you might have to travel long ways around your world to get to. You can kind of compress them, put them basically next to each other, and with this fictional idea of the ship, it makes sense in a way that it wouldn't make sense to have, you know, your tundra right next to your desert and on a hex map, you'd go like, that doesn't make any sense at all unless there was magic or something else mystical involved. In this case, it's like, no, it's just levels five and then level three or six or whatever. Okay, so now we are getting onto devices and units on the ship. We have color bands. These are radiated bracelets with one of six different color frequencies on them. They're the, uh, the system they used to permit entrance to any of the sections of the ship and to control many devices. These bands have various harmless radiations implanted in them according to their color. Radiation is a half-life of a thousand years. Okay, don't. I love the specificity. It doesn't matter to me, but great. I only really want to know if these would be dying within the course of a, of a game if you could lose your band and, or your band is dying and you need to get another one. The four captains of the ship have special radiated rings serving the same purpose as the bracelets. The command personnel band is alternating blue and red. The horticultural band is bright green. The security band is red. The general purpose band issued to all members of the ship is brown. Engineering band is steel gray. The medical band is white. All areas sensitive to these bands have the appropriate color in three by eight inch in a three by eight inch rectangle. Devices are activated by touching the ring or band of the appropriate color to the device. Makes sense. And I like that their numbers. I think we've talked about, you know, how do you warn or how do you do things for people that you might might be coming way after you and not share culture or anything, but having colors makes sense. You don't not that this is necessarily what the reasoning behind it, but for this kind of game, you don't need to know necessarily, though you might, you don't need to know, let's say, that you're engineering band, but you know that you can get into gray. You can see the color of your band and the color of the doors areas and you know that they're gray and you can kind of surmise or you're taught if you're growing up in this situation that okay you can go in the gray areas you can go in the red areas so it's pretty cool and even the blue and red you don't know necessarily know what it means if you're a native and you're i don't know if, how much they remember i guess we'll probably get into that later how much i don't think they remember too much from what was before but you know that it's kind of special which is what it is because you're command personnel so it is special but it's, it's it's definitely a good way to have that kind of have some kind of classification without it being in writing or something else that presumably the meaning of which could get lost over time. While all family units in the city have the same standard equipment, the stress is is on the decorative wishes of the members living in the unit. Okay, so that's in the city hall monitors. These are three tensed cameras with audio pickups at the end of every corridor and every level. They have a variable focus for full length and close shots. Good to know. The lenses are equipped with infrared sensors for the night periods. The cameras display their pictures, their pictures on the security systems screen. The cameras are encased in a polysynthetic cube to prevent vandalism. Good. And we have gravity generators. We have engineering walkways. We have inclined planes in place of stairs. We have an ecologically ecology life analyzer handy. Oh, well, that's a mouthful. It's interesting they put these here. It's, it's one of these, um, it's, I'm always fascinated by how, especially with these older games, that you don't have a lot of history around you to look at and say, how should we organize our games? It's very interesting. We get the layout, which is cool, but then we go into these devices, which is also cool. But I wonder if, 
I can imagine if I was writing this kind of game now, I probably wouldn't have this here. Because to me, I look at like, what is the most important thing? And it's the bands I think are maybe important, but maybe I'd have, you know, what your characters are, what they're doing, that kind of thing first or create a character. But it's just kind of an interesting choice that we, we're getting all this stuff about the, not only just the general stuff about the ship, which I think can be very helpful, but also these kind of specific things. I can only presume that maybe they're going to be abundant or something that, that people are going to have access to because you want to make sure that everyone kind of knows about them as opposed to like a magic item type thing where if one might show up, it's going to be very rare. Now, I don't know if that's the case or not, but I, that would be my thought process. Engineering system handy unit. We have a security handy unit. I guess these do go in line with the color bands because basically each one of these has somewhat of a role attached to it. Engineering would go with engineering. We don't have ecology, do we? Was there an ecology one? Maybe horticultural? Not sure. Definitely got security. There is an ecology. Well, there's another energy tracer, a security tracer unit, a medical hand analyzer, and healer. I'm guessing these, a lot of these would be, what was the, like a tricorder type thing? Maybe a tricorder they divided into bits. Because I think a tricorder in Star Trek kind of has all these in them pretty much. No, I guess... I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking classic Trek. I guess classic Trek McCoy had a different little whirly bit thing that he would use. Security, okay, so medical, sonic torch, atomic torch. Atomics! This device is powered by an isotope of thorium and is able to cut through any material given time. All right, We've got a laser torch. Water hydrogen energy converter. This simple device is able to draw hydrogen from water and store it in a hydrogen energy cell. That's cool. We got some spacesuits. We got Geiger counters, a breathing lung for underwater, infrared goggles, chemical defoliants. These chemicals are able to act on the fiber of any plant and cause it to die and rot almost instantly. Eh, that's going to be useful. Chemical acids. Oof. These chemicals are able to disintegrate substances according to the strength of the acid. Note, there are very few acids able to disintegrate metal. But, you know, flesh, bone, all fair game. Chemical flammables, portable energy lamp, sound elimination headphones. <laughs> All right. You were thinking ahead, James Ward. You you predicted a whole bunch of, uh, well, what is it like? Uh, what's the name of the bows and all those different silent headphones? Radioactive material, including something called Duraloy. Oops. Sorry. All right. Now we're on the Starship equipment. God, I am just fascinated that they put these things up front. But. Here's a listing of the various features and equipment on board the Starship. All right, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna breeze through these, right? So we have a standard general purpose robot, which sounds amazing, awesome. An ecology robot, the forest model. So I guess they're different models. Ecology robot, the garden model. I guess let me read one of these. Which one of these seems good? Let's see what else we have here. We have a medical robot, engineering robot, security robot. Let's read the security robot. I mean, that one's not as interesting. Let's read the. Let's go with the forest model. This unit is equipped with follows. And here we have an A. They're listed with an alphabetical. I'm not sure why, but we have A, independent action circuits, enabling it to go beyond its normal programming to carry out its task. That's an interesting thing. I don't know what that means. It has normal programming, it's able to, but then it has this circuit enabling it to go beyond it. So, I don't know. Anyway, I guess that just is a, I guess they put is the reasoning there, kind of a meta thing to say that, hey, you could do stuff that's not forestry because of these independent action circuits it's just and plus we don't are we even going to get a sense of what his normal programming is in this list don't know all right b a power cell effective for 72 hours of continuous continuous operation uh, c a recharging unit allowing the device to recharge its cell while continuing limited operation d uh and grav units i think maybe anti is what they mean there hold on with excess and grav units with an excess capacity of 270 kilograms, 595 pounds. I don't know what that means. What's it, what do we think and grav means? That's, I, I want to say that that's a typo for anti-grav, but it could not be. I'm wondering if it's something to help carry stuff. I'm kind of wondering if this is uh, the uh, floating disc that they could use, you know, pile some stuff on and up to, it can carry up to 595 pounds and it floats on anti-grav. That's my thought, but I don't know. Two paralysis tentacles with an extension of 18 meters from tip to tip, primarily for animal capture. Terrence is an artisan hand-hewn wooden for forest robot. That would be good if you saw those as uh, like uh, scarecrows that they they've been kind of making 
scarecrows, but uh, the shape of these force robots. Tentacles outstretched for maximum scare. A paralysis field ranging up to 65 meters serving the same function as the tentacles. All right, so, you can, so it's basically in terms of, you know, its attacks and stuff. It got two, par two tentacles and then some kind of area effect field, which can go very far. I mean, these ranges are far. So the tentacles themselves can go 60 feet, and the field can extend up to 213 feet. A high propulsion unit enabling the robot tra robot to travel up to 96 kilometers an hour, so it can it can speed along. Gamers and Game says that words leaves a legacy, positive, negative, negative. He's a loaded topic. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Gosh, I, I I don't know too much about the negative side of it. Uh, maybe I'm just, I guess sometimes ignorance is bliss. But you know, he's somebody that was around. When you know, it's hard. You lose these guys who are around, kind of at the beginning of things. But I can't say I was following too much of his career. I think the last things I saw, and it might have been, I might just be thinking of what I just read just like last couple of hours. Um, oh, transphobia. Oh, that's a, that's a bummer. I didn't know about that. And, but, you know, we're going to honor his, <laughs> we're going to honor his positive stuff. And uh, maybe I'll have to, if I can, uh, if I can, if I, if I can find some links to some things, I'll, I'll throw them in there. Yeah, I didn't follow Giant. I know he's involved with Giant Lands. I, I was going to say that. I rather I don't. I know that Giant Lands was then somehow involved with the, the new TSR, which was horrible. But I know then they kind of broke away, tried to go free. But I, I didn't follow it too much, probably because of the connection to the new TSR stuff. So unknown. But if there if there is stuff, I'll try to link to it. But yeah, at, at this point, I just want to celebrate. I guess his contributions. Is positive contributions to the hobby, and I'll have to look up other stuff later on. Oh, uh, whatever were we? Okay, the process field, we got that. A high propulsion unit, we got that. Three optical lenses with a maximum range of a mile and a minimum range of a meter. Oh, pools of radiance. Yeah, I, I remember, I don't remember the book pool of radiance, but man, I played the video game of pool of radiance, and I I'm, don't know if that's before or after the book, but that video game was seminal. Um, uh, I loved it. I loved it. Didn't play. Didn't get to play Pool of Darkness as much. And there was that third one, which I can't recall. It was Pool of Radiance, Pool of Darkness. Oh, Curse of the Azure Bonds. I think it was. I'm gonna say that. I'm gonna guess those came after the books. They were great, but they were. Uh, if you haven't played those video games, I'm sure. I hope. Fingers crossed. You can find them something. But one of the things that was so funny about the games it was turn-based D and D. And, and and you're playing it in kind of a top down. It's super super basic looking. I think even at the time it wasn't particularly groundbreaking. Uh, okay, Curse of the Azure Bonds was the second one. Okay, so maybe it went Pool of Radiance, Curse of the Azure Bonds, and then Pool of Darkness. That probably makes sense. And you're uh, you're playing, it, but all combat it's turn by turn. And what was funny is you could get into a tavern brawl. So you could go in the tavern in the town. I forget the name of the town. And you could get in this tavern brawl, and there's like a hundred individuals in this ever brawl and if you end up in this fight this fight felt like i mean it felt like back then it could take for, it would take forever i don't even know how long it would take now but it's just because each you know you're literally round one and it's and guys are moving you see their map zoom over and some guy in the corner is moving and it just it was like oh my gosh this is gonna take forever uh old oh yeah old patrol yeah hills far that was another good one um I never played Secret of the Silver Swords, but I remember Hillsfire. Hillsfire was a totally different kind of game, which is also kind of cool. So just, these, just, just to, to wrap up on these robots, just interesting enough, no stat lines yet, but just a, a, just a bunch of their... It's a really an interesting way of listing their abilities. I'm, this is where I'd love to ask. I'm curious about this way of laying it out. Like, why lay it out like this as opposed to, like, a creature entry? Because uh, we don't get an idea of hit points, armor class. You know, we don't get any of that stuff. I don't even know. I don't even remember what they use in here. But we don't have any of that stuff. But this, presumably, we're going to get these later. But I imagine this is maybe, I, I had the feeling that they must have felt that this was kind of scene setting stuff. You're getting the ship. And you're getting the layouts. And then you're getting kind of stuff. And you're getting the robots. Now we're getting, you know, weapon systems. But it's, it's pretty fascinating because we're not getting any, we're, uh, now we're maybe getting some particulars. <laughs> I like that they call them protein disruptors. Uh, so we have pistols, one to ten meters. Close. So we have close range, medium range, max range. Pistols, rifles, and then protection. 
All right, so now we're getting a little bit more into the mechanics. Buki Kid says that mentions that Hillsfar was like a bunch of mini games. Yep, it was. You did all these kind of different little things in this town of Hillsfar. I just I remember loving it, but I was never that good at it. Uh, oh, the Gamers on Games mentions Dragon Magazine 154. I'll have to look that one up. I'm all the dragons are floating around somewhere. I should be able to find it. And I have a bunch on my hard drive somewhere. So we're getting okay. So protection. You roll three sided dice. Graph shows minimum score needed. Okay. All right. So here we got some interesting stuff. So it's not you're not it's not the defender rolling. I presume that it's the attacker rolling. So we're doing three six sided dice. We're not doing a d20. We're doing three d6, which means we're getting that. We're this is where we're I believe at three d6 we actually have a technical bell curve. At least for your rolling, and you have to roll the minimum is a shallow hit. Half penetration and then full penetration. So if you're in close, if you're at short range, you're kind of toast because you're three to eight. So you know you're you're hit basically. You're hit any anywhere, but if you roll, but if you roll less than an eight or less than I guess equal to an eight, then it's only shallow penetration, and then okay. So hold on a minute. All right, here we go. There's the example. All right, so range short, protection cloth. You roll a three, that's shallow. Okay, that there we go. Four to eight is half penetration. Nine or more is full penetration. So basically, if you're wearing cloth, you're getting hit by a, one of these energy systems at close range or protein disruptors. Then um, you're pretty, it's pretty brutal. Not a good, not a good, uh, not a good deal for you. A hydrogen energy cell that enables the weapon to shoot 25 times powers the pistol. The rifle shoots 10 times in the same type of cell. All right. Very good. Optional shield attachment. Yes, this is Metamorphosis Alpha. I believe um, first edition Metamorphosis Alpha. So we're talking circa 1976. We have sonic metal disruptors. This makes a sonic field around its target and will shatter processed metal by vibration at full effect. Whoa. And then again, we've got scores needed to roll. So this is, uh, so we're not, you know, with, we're rolling versus armor class, essentially. But now we've, now it's split, split into ranges and kind of ranges within ranges. So we don't have a single number anymore. What we have is a minimum number. And then if you roll in the range, you have your medium number and then afterwards oh if you if you go over the medium number then it's your the max it's pretty interesting I, it, it would that would be an interesting thing to mess around with with like your fantasy armor classes if you had that you have your minimum range and then the max i wonder i wonder if the, how that would work I'd be curious about that oh forgotten realms the archives on steam oh i'll have to check that out thanks for the hit me up on that kabuki kid i may have to we have to load that onto my laptop. And the other thing you could do is you could import your characters into the game. So if you had a tabletop game, you can import it. But it also meant that you could basically set your whole guy to 18s across the board if you wanted to, which, okay, I will confess I did a few times. Um, just 18, 18, 18, 18, 18. I think, I think you could. In some of those games, you definitely could. I think in Pools, Pool of Rage, you could. Because there was like a, oh, yeah, it's like, here, bring in your character from your game. It's like, oh, my character happened to have 18s across the board with 18, 100 strength. And I don't I don't think the game cared really. We have a paralysis rods, paralysis darts, laser pistols, and now we're gonna have some we have a list here, but not a not in a rollable list as of yet. But we have Earth Animals of the Ship. Oh, and there's steam sales. All right. I'm gonna look that up. I'm gonna have to set a reminder to do that after after I get off here. So we have I'm not gonna go through and read all these things, but we have a whole bunch of lists of animals we can pull from. These are all mundane. I believe. I don't know what asked. Asked butterflies. Is that assistant? Assistant. I don't know. What is asked? Anyone know? Asked? Got some, got me some ass, ass moths. I'm not sure what that is. Panfish. Panfish in all. Panfish across the board. Third stage slug protector. Ooh, what's that? This unit shoots a blunted latex dum dum pellet. Okay, gas ejector. Uh, 
charge 500 darts. There go. Hey. <clears throat> ah, the DVD collection. Yeah, I, I think I had a DVD of this, but I lost them long ago. Beginning the game, developing characters. Here we go. Whoops. To begin the game, to begin a game, the referee will set up his version of parts of the starship and then work with individual players in developing their game characters. So interestingly here, what is this? I love they just throw this in here. Set up his version of the parts of the starship. So I guess they said before we went through what the levels were, that they were just examples. So presumably, you as the referee can use that as a baseline, or you could create your own ship with its own levels. That's a lot of pressure to put on first. But obviously, they're opening the door. Of like, hey, you you were going to create your own ship. I would probably, I think from my first game, I, I just stick with what we have already, what's been established. But letting you know, you can you can create your own version. So if there's something you didn't like, if you wanted to move things around like me, I was like, oh, I don't know if I like the labs being with the forest, the like the chemical stuff, then, you know, I could move it somewhere. If a beginning if a beginning player is a human, he or she will start the game in one of the human settlements, which are more like a village than anything else, enjoying the protection and supplies such an area provides. A human player will roll three six-sided dice several times for the abilities he or she has at the start of the game. Each player has the following abilities, radiation resistance, mental resistance, dexterity, con, constitution, strength, and leadership potential. So we're, we're finally getting into uh, some of the nittier, grittier stuff. So our stats here, Radiation resistance, which makes sense given the setting. Mental resistance, which is interesting. You know, your dex, your con, your strength. And then this one, it's not it's not quite a, uh, a it's or it's maybe it's a, a specific type of charisma, which is leadership potential. So clearly we're not working with, you know, some of the like sex appeal or whatever kind of stuff. It's like, no, this is just how good are you? What kind of potential do you have as sort of a leader of folk? player choosing to be a mutation, whether humanoid or monster-like, has the first five abilities, but no leadership potential. That's interesting. Plus physical and mental mutations. These last two abilities are determined by rolling a four-sided die once for physical mutations and once for mental mutations, and allowing the player to pick from one to four powers, with the only limiting factor being the number of powers given by the die roll. Player mutations start in the forested area of the ship with no material goods. So if you start off as a mutant, you're obviously, you're kind of powered up, but you don't have any stuff. Or feasibly protection or other things. The, you don't have the benefits of the village. In the village. The, we, we, it's, it's interesting here, though, because we haven't... It's kind of the first time we're hearing, other than the, the intro about kind of mutations. And things. We haven't even seen yet if you choose or you can roll a die to see whether you're a mutation or not. Unknown. The judge will also roll randomly for one physical or mental defect or one of each if the player has five or more total mutations for the mutated player. So it's not all, you know, beans and gravy here. We're going to get some, you're going to get some bad, bad news there. Players and judges will keep a record of the abilities and limitations of their character, and each character's abilities will be initially unknown to other players, but will be learned during the game through contact, observation, or interaction. So just another kind of just interesting note, you know, you're not, you're theoretically, you're not supposed to share it. You know, you're not supposed to sit around the table and say, oh, who are you playing? Oh, I'm playing a mutant with such and such. You're supposed to kind of keep it to yourself. I don't know how many people actually did that. I mean, it can be fun to do that. But I don't know. So we have some radiate. We have some tables here. Let's see. Terrence said that in an interview, Ward said he named the ship the Warden after himself, assuming uh, GMs would do the same. And was surprised to find out that most of them just assumed the Warden was the default setting. Uh, yeah, I mean, I totally get it. I mean, you know, it's just, it's a lot of work, right? You start playing the game, you kind of want to get in and do it. And you read like, oh, I can, you can make this ship your own, or you can just use the ship as it already is. Like, I could see a lot of people going, yeah, I'm just going to use the warden. Like, it's, this is the ship. So it doesn't actually surprise me in the least. Plus, it's not, it's the, it's the set dressing, right? But it's not the, uh, I don't feel like it's that important, ultimately the ship it's not like your own personal kingdom or something that you're building so i can also see it not being something where a lot of gms are or are thinking here's where i'm going to flex my creative muscles are in the kind of levels and the naming of the ship so we have our ability explanations i'm gonna i think radiation resistance we get it we have this table with your resistance and then the intensity level which doesn't really mean too much it, other than it kind of looks a little bit like the cleric turntable. The higher the intensity level, 
I'm guessing that the Ds here at the extreme ends are death and then some kind of damage. Yeah, so the graph represents exposure after one melee turn. The D represents death caused by exposure for that one melee turn, no matter how many hit points the player or creature has. So if you end up over your head radiation-wise, you're, you're just done. So you encounter a radiation level 18. Your radiation level is radiation resistance is less than uh, less than oh what was that twelve? Your toast. Other than that, I'm not sure what the numbers mean in terms of exposure. There is a twenty percent chance that you'll get uh, you'll just get a mutation instead of dying. There is that for you. Does it say player with eighteen? Oh, I see. Your exposure goes down, I guess, by these numbers. So yeah, you gotta. You don't want. You don't, you don't want to be there. You don't want to be at radiation intensity level eighteen. How's how's that? Mental resistance. What does it say? Whoops. This ability deals with the player's power to withstand an attack on his or her mind by mental energy. All right. Like I said, I'm gonna skip over the. Skip over the. Uh, the we're not gonna be playing, so I'm not gonna worry too much. But we have a, essentially another table. Resistance versus the attacking power. Dexterity, I think we got dexterity, strength, yep, leadership potential. This leadership factor is used not only to see how many men will follow a person, but to determine if other creatures will follow. Okay, so in that sense, it basically is charisma. But I like it, a different term, it kind of gives a different feel to it. I think it kind of is, uh, it also has this, I guess, I want to say what, like, like a little bit of import in the session, right? That where we're dealing with in this time, it's, we're looking for leadership like that's the important thing as opposed to other you could have named it you could have kept this charisma you could have called it something else but here it's clear that what are people and mutants and everything trying to do it's kind of survival you're trying to get together you're trying to find somebody who you think will be a, a leader and that's kind of the most important element as opposed to other uses of aura or charisma or appeal oh what wait there was another two what did we miss with this table here so the leadership potential at 18, there's a 25% chance a friendly mutated being will follow. Also a 45% chance that a friendly mutated human will follow. And max followers, 12. So we do have hirelings, but they're calling them followers here. All right. Note, a player may not give up a mutated follower of any type just to get another mutated follower they think might be better. No upgrades on the followers. And there's an example here of a player trying to get a follower, which is good, but I'm not going to go through it right now. Uh, let's see, we have constitution. I think we understand that, though. Here we have another table of constitution versus poison. This is one of the things I wonder if, now I'm looking at these tables, they're not all the same. This is one thing where I wonder if I was going to do this now, I probably would make these all basically the same table. I'm not sure. This is one of those things that having three different tables for these, I wonder if you could just have effect versus attribute and have just one set. You know, the effect goes up to eight from three to 18. Your attribute goes from three to 18. And so you just, you crunch the numbers and you come to it. And then as opposed to having, and then if you wanted to have something be stronger, you could add you know, plus one or the, your constitution minus one or whatever, or whatever attribute minus something. This might be an easier way. It's just, I think it's an interesting, I think a lot of things, I'm thinking if, you know, I'm looking at, well, if someone were doing this now, what, what might they do differently? I, I imagine maybe, maybe that would be one of these, that's what I would do. I don't know that I need three tables just to show these are slightly, like, is the difference between the way this works and some of the other ones important enough? to warrant having its own table that I have to reference separately than if I had a basic table that could cover everything. So now we have given an, an example of a beginning player. So their name is Scarlock. They have 16 radiation resistance, 18 mental resistance. Dex is only 7, Constitution's 9, Strength is 12, and Leadership Potential is 17. So that's a nice, I mean, a 16, seven, a 16 17, 18, and their low score is a 7. They also got 12 mixed in there. I mean, that's pretty darn good. Scarlock rolls his hit points using 9, his Constitution rating. Six-sided dice and scores. Okay, so you're getting a lot of hit points. You're starting with a lot. So you, you con is nine, so you roll nine hit six-sided dice. And so he starts with a nine con, starts off with 30 hit points. That is the number of hits he can withstand before dying. 
You can have up to 10 human followers because there's high leadership potential and will have a 20%, 20% chance for attracting a mutated creature or 30% for attracting a mutated human to follow him. Should he ever meet any? To start, Skrullock will be assumed to possess the normal living materials common to his tribe, clothes, weapons, etc., plus any other assorted items the referee sees fit to give him to start with. Okay, so that's impressive. You're starting well with a lot of hit points for your level. So I guess that's good, but as uh, I think it was Kabuki Kid mentioned about TPKs, clearly having, clearly having a lot of hit points is not necessarily going to save you from having an early TPK. Now we get an example of a mutated humanoid character. Name is Lockscar. Hmm. Radiation resistance 18, mental resistance 6. Dexterity, 17. Constitution, 5. Oof. Strength, 18. All right. Are they, what are they rolling here? Is this, is this, is this, uh, did they say what, and this is also weird because they haven't said what dice you're rolling yet, I don't think. The layout here is just, I'm not missing anything, am I? I don't think so. Let me say, obviously, I'm not missing pages. This is 12, and above us was 11. Yeah, I'm going in order. I don't have it in spread mode and I'm skipping spreads. So this is uh we haven't I don't we haven't really been given the step by step of how you're actually rolling these up. But these examples are interesting. If we're rolling 3d6 and they got 18 twice, that's snazzy. That's where in a real game someone's going like, let me see you roll these. Let me see you roll these. This is where someone rolled their strength and the radiation resistance first, and they said, Oh, I rolled two 18s. And everyone else is like, let me roll, let me like I think you're gonna roll those dice in front of me from now on. And then they're like, oh, five and six. It's like, yeah. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. So Lockscar gets a roll of four on four-sided die for the number of physical mutations and a roll of two for mental mutations. Oh, sorry, sorry. They rolled a four for a number of physical mutations and then two for mental mutations. He picks up the following. I guess he gets to choose. So he got he picked up Poison Claws, which has an intensity level at Judge's option, which is interesting. Radiated Eyes, which we don't know what that means yet. Physical Reflection, also don't know what it means yet. And Regeneration. Because of the poor constitution. That makes sense. Mental mutations. They have mental control and mental blast. The re -re referee then rolls for defects of the mutation and determines that Lockscar is nearsighted and epileptic. Oof. With a 5% chance of the epilepsy occurring in every combat situation. Well, you know, so that's basically a roll of 1 or a 20. Take your pick on a d20 that you have a fit. Every combat. That guy, guy is massively strong. First combat rolls, rolls 1. Starts flopping on the ground. So that is our mutated humanoid, mutated character example. We have Rax Kakul. And you get where they're going with these names? Have you, have you figured that out? Radiation resistance, resistance 14, con 11, mental resistance 13, strength 18, deck 17. Still, these are rare rolling. Oof. Player chose to start out with a bear's body. That's cool. He rolls a four for physical mutations and a two for mental mutations and picks the following. Poison Claws, man, there's got to be a run on Poison Claws. Everyone loves those Poison Claws. New body parts, smaller, and has wings. With mu mental mutations of teleportation and telepathy. Ah, so he can communicate. That's a sneaky one. That's nice, because bears can't normally talk, so having the telepathy gets around that. And this particular <laughs> bear person has hemophilia and a fear impulse for humans. That's a tough one in this kind of game, to give you a fear impulse for humans, but... Hey, that's what you, you got, what you got. And then, all right, so here we're getting the list of, so I guess it's a 40, there's 42, and they're numbered 1 to 42, which includes both physical and, oh, that's, in, oh, the defects are at the top. Hold on a minute, so, wait a minute, so what are we doing here? And this is labeled G, what's the G? Oh, I think that's just the overall list. Physical and mental mutations. Player may pick from the two lists given after rolling a four side die for each to see how many he or she may choose. The judge will then roll and give the player a defect in either or both physical or mental mutation chart. So the defects are on the labeled 31 to 42. I don't know why they're numbered because you're not rolling a die to pick them, but I guess they just wanted to number them out. And I'm not, I don't know why they numbered it in one list instead of two because it, it just doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't quite make sense to me, but. Anyhow, so the physical mutations, we've got taller, shorter, outsized body parts, new body parts, poison claws or fangs, multiple body parts, regeneration, gas generation, quills, gills, chameleon powers, radiated eyes, electricity or heat generation, sonic abilities, light generation, physical reflection, partial carapace, total carapace, 
a whole bunch of heightened uh, senses, wings, shape change, either to reptile, animal, insect, or all of them. I mean, why wouldn't you choose all of them? I don't know. Density control. Those are your physical mutations. Then for the defects, multi-armed, <laughs> one to 10, but you have no control over them. That's a bad, I don't know if I want multi-armed if I can't control any of them. Body structure change, skin structure change, hemophilia, bacterial non-resistance, no sensory nerve endings. I'm not sure what that means. Poor respiration systems, diminished senses, attraction odor, nearsightedness or double vision, no resistance to poison or double effect of physical forces. Yeah, those definitely seem like defects. As explained earlier, some physical mutations may make it impossible to have other physical mutations. Right, so if you're taller, you can't be shorter. If you're shorter, you can't be taller. If you're shorter, heightened strength is reduced. If you're taller, you cannot have a total carapace or have wings. Ah, so that's why the bear person wanted to be smaller. Oh, is that what it is? Because it's no sensory nerve endings. You feel no pain, but that can be a problem. Ah, okay, so like that, that makes sense. I would, you know, that's one of those things where they could have just put, like, can't feel pain or something. Just be, but I, I suppose, I assume, I hope there'll be, there, there are some written explanations for these down the line. Ian says, no sensory nerve ending. I would let them take damage to reroll strength rolls. Oh, that's interesting. So you have, okay, so then, yeah, so you just different mutations have you limitations, which makes sense. Ah, uh, here we go. Okay, now they explain them. I don't think I you know the ones the 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 uh, mutations. I don't think really need too much explanation. I get it. Intensity of the poison up to the referee seems interesting. I I, th I think I just had that go with your level. Something like that. Why does the why does the referee get to pick? And I would. I mean, maybe I could see if the referee if if someone rolled one mutation, someone else rolled four mutations, and the one mutation they chose was poison. Claws. I could see it as a kind of to be a nice thing, saying, "Okay, the two guys got poison claws. One guy with four mutations, one guy with one mutation. So the person who only had one, I'll make it more power. But I feel like just make it level. Then I could just say level plus one." Parents says extra arms means double the deodorant budget. I suppose that would be. Uh, Kabuki Kids says they have this they have this version of the game, and then the two, 2008 version. And obviously, the newer version is much clearer on everything. Yeah, well, you know, with the benefit of time and hindsight, all that, one would hope. One would hope. Uh, okay, all these things are good. So I wonder if you pick all, would that? All right, the ability, so just for shape change, because I'm curious, the ability to assume the outer appearance of one of the three groups of mutations, animals, insect, or reptile, but not have the powers of those mutations. Only one group may be chosen normally, it must be chosen at the start of the campaign. This change requires two melee turns of complete inactivity to be accomplished. If the mutant is a shape changer, he or she may have no other physical mutation. They select to be able to change it to any shape instead of just one. I see. So if you had one mutation, pick shape change. Seems pretty cool. If the mutant picks only one of the types listed, then they may choose other mutations as well. Oh, all right. So if you pick all, that's all you're getting. So maybe if you had one mutation, shape change might want to pick, but you don't get. Do not get the powers of those mutations, just the look. Seems like. There's a little sub passage here called subclassification of shape change, which is also in quotes for some reason. An offshoot of the shape change mutation is the ability to sense radiation areas, draw power from these, and imitate the force so that the mutant is unaffected by the damaging radiation. This imitation is immediate and works as a defense against the radiated eyes mutation should be considered separate from the above shape-changing mutation and can be picked alone or with other mutations. All right. That's kind of neat one. It's like an energy shape change kind of thing. Kind of cool. All right. On the defects. So if you got extra arms, these arms interfere with the manipula manipulation ability of the mutant, subtracting one from hitting possibility of the mutant for every extra arm. So if you have 10 extra arms, you are El Scrudo. Oh, that's just great. You got all these arms. And there's going nuts though. Like, how would you get anything done if you had 10 extra arms and none of them will listen to you? Or I guess you have 12 arms total. Only two will actually listen to your commands. The rest are just beating you around. And where would, where would they all be? All right, so body structure change means that your bones, your body and bones, instead of being calcium, it's some other substance that lowers, resist, lowers your body's resistance. 
I'm feeling it. All right, what did we say? It was no sensory, no sensory nerve endings. This means a mutant cannot feel pain or use their sense of touch in any way. Aha, so it's not just pain, it's just touch. You're just, you don't feel anything. You're, you're numb at all times. While the less intelligent person might think, oh boy, I will not be bothered by sword cuts, this defect cancels the body's warning systems. A mutant will be unable to feel a surprise attack from behind or even tell when he is being punctured. There could be four hours in his back and he wouldn't even know it. Ah, oh, so interesting one with that one is that really has to play into a bit of the GM or referee has to kind of be aware of that one to play into it. But I would, um, I feel like if arrows entered the body, okay, granted you don't feel the puncture, I imagine the force of arrows hitting you because they, they're not just sliding in. Like a knife blade might just, if it's super sharp, you might just think of it sliding in and you're not feeling it. But there's the, you know, there's the impact, the, the part of it where it's a projectile that's banging into you. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. So I, I, I don't know. I might give them a roll for just feeling, they don't, they, they don't feel the, they don't feel the impact, but they're, you know, you're pushed forward. You're, oh yeah, kind of thing. I don't know. Ian asks that the arms take over and control you like Dr. Octopus. I, I don't think they do. I think they're just, they're just, maybe that's the problem is they don't have any kind of unifying intelligence. So they're just thrashing around. Traction odor. This universal secretion comes from the mutant's body and makes the mutant smell very edible to any meat eating creature. Uh, that's a tough one. All right, now on the mental side, we've got heightened intelligence, mental paralysis, teleportation, levitation, telepathy. Multiple increasing of power through contact with similar entities, a.k.a. mass mind. Um, that sounds interesting. Precog, illusion generation, mental control, telekinesis, force field generation, repulsion field, mental blast, mental vent shield, reflection, power, pyrokinesis, cryogenics, weather manipulation, life leech, charismatic effect, magnetic control, density control, others. Mental transparency, absorption, molecular disruption, time field manipulation, death field generation, planar travel, will force, planar travel, that's an interesting one for this setting, will force, mental control over physical state, de-evolution, telekinetic arm, dual brain, heightened brain talent, military or scientific or economic genius, temporal fugue, intuition. And then in defects, complete mental block for either technology, robotics, plants, or animals, fear impulses for types, some type, uh, mental defenseless defenselessness, multiple damage, epilepsy, poor dual brain, poor, poor dual brain, anti-leadership potential, anti-reflection. You are the you, sir, are the anti-leader. Uh, Kabuki Kid says the Doc Ock arm idea is pretty fun, but a GM could play with that. Yeah, you yes, but it couldn't be to the remember it's a defect, so it can't be to the benefit of the player or the party. It's gotta be something that poses an obstacle. Something they have to deal with. But it can't be too much. Right, you don't want to make it too much so that it would just be so onerous that no one would want to play with it. So you, you could you could have some fun with it, but you'd have to be pretty, I think you'd have to be kind of subtle. You know, if the arms are constant, like, because they mention here things to hit. So in combat, the arms are going nutso, but I imagine they can't be going nutso all the time. How could you eat? How could you sleep? How could, you couldn't do anything. Like, you'd just be, just, you would have died as a baby with 10 baby arms just not allowing you to do anything. So you just got to be, careful with it but you know maybe in a gonzo 24 person con game yeah like that, that guy's just running around with his arms somehow he made it to adulthood and the arms just went nuts and and that's just his stick for the five minutes he lives and then you roll up another person uh terrence asked if there is a table entry for getting a quato oh man wait uh we need a quato i suppose if you wanted to have dual brain dual brain might work as quato so what I'm, I'm curious about mass mind, mass mind, this mutation allows the mutant to emphasize, empathize, emphasize that maybe that too, empathize with creatures of a like nature, same species or like power, all having mental control, etc., to increase the existing abilities of the commanding mutant. It would be possible to send a double strength mind blast or use precog a, a day ahead instead of just a few minutes. This power works in direct proportion to the number of beings working together. Oh, that's kind of cool. So you could, if you wanted to plan up, I mean, this kind of goes against the part of where you're not supposed to tell everybody your mutations, but I feel like I would totally let a group come together and say like, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to all gain some of the same stuff. And one of us is going to take mass mind and then we can, I mean, maybe, maybe that would make it too strong. I don't know. That seems kind of funny. 
if we could get quoting a quato if you don't know if you missed that reference it's from total recall i never saw the newer total recall one did that have quato in it but quato was definitely a highlight of uh from the original arnold schwarzenegger uh total recall and i forget the guy's name who also played like uh he was also in twins he always played bad guys he was the assassin in twins you never see his face and this is one of the few times where he played a good guy and he was kawato's i don't know what you call him handler what would you call what would you call that he was his human i guess his host i just want to look up the guy's name because he's a good actor but he always just plays a well, he's good at playing. He's one of those guys that always played bad guys. And then, for whatever reason, in Total Recall, they have him as a good guy. Because if I had seen that guy, I would be like, man, he's not a good guy. I know that actor. He is always terrible. Uh-oh, that's, well, what's his name? Let's see. Marshall Bell. Is that him? Tall, imposing character actor with a penetrating stare. Yep, Marshall Bell. Yeah, he is in Starship Troopers, too. Absolutely. So there's another tie-in. Kubuki Kid says the newer Total Recall is hugely skippable. Doesn't include Mars at all? Oh, that seems weird. I haven't read the book, though, or the story. This is another one of those uh, short stories converted. I haven't read it, but I, I the, the 19, was it 1990 Total Recall, whatever, is classic. I mean, I will... <laughs> I think my daughter probably thinks I'm insane, but she has like a, there's someone in her class named Melina. And whenever I hear the name Melina, I'm always Melina. I don't know. And the, and that, 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 that other character actor who plays the, the prostitute with the three breasts, who was also in, um, uh, she was in, uh, uh, oh, Lethal Weapon. She's another one who always show up in these little small roles. Yeah, Kawato did look gooey. All right, let's see what let's see what second brain says. Make, can we let's see if we could get the Kawato out of this guy. I mean, I would I would definitely as a GM as a referee, I would definitely absolutely allow your dual brain to be Kawato. But I feel like that makes it actually more vulnerable because someone could basically punch you punch your Kawato to death. Okay, dual brain. This mutation mutation takes the form of two brains with all the powers two brains imply, not necessarily in one head. Okay, well look at that. he's left it. He's left it open for you. Whoops. Uh, where was dual? Oh, did I, oh, there it is. Uh, let's see. This allows a being to figure out any given artifact faster, and while a mental attack may affect one brain, the other brain can override any harmful effects control the body. These brains may have only three other mental mutations total. Well, there you go. So I would totally, I think that totally gives an opening to have a Kawato. So I would say maybe the, I mean, Kawato doesn't do anything with his little baby arms but i would probably say that you don't get to use those they're 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 too uh um yeah they just well, i was there's a word i'm thinking of and i can't think of it vestigial they're too vest vestigial <laughs> we guess that's when they saw the theater with their friend they screamed when the when when the <laughs> rest of women show up yeah yep those are the things you remember and Benny, good, another good Benny villain. Well, I say another good. He might have been the first good Benny villain. I love Benny from the Mummy movies. He's a great kind of bad guy henchman. And, and Benny in Total Recall with all these guys fit kids to feed. I got five kids to feed. I don't know why he gets so mad at Quaid. Because at the end, he's like, I'm going to kill you, Quaid. It's like, what did Quaid do to him? I mean, he was, he was, Quaid was giving him a decent fare. I don't know if Quaid was just a bad tipper or what. But Benny just. I don't know. Benny turned. Benny turned. I don't know who bought Benny off. Michael Ironside was good in that one, too. Kind of a di interesting kind of, because he's smart, but like not quite smart enough to catch on what his boss is doing. And of course, uh, what's his, well, what's the boss's name? Um, oh, I'll think of it in a minute, but uh, Bogomil from Lethal, from not Lethal, well, from Beverly Hills Cop. Uh, you know, it's like, I don't know why he's just not sharing more of his plan. I suppose it maybe he felt that Quaid or somebody would have caught on if he told other people, but you know, it might have been a good thing. Letting in your number, letting your number two in on your plan a little bit might have helped. Yeah, Kabuki mentioned screw you. That was Arnold's comeback. 
If you haven't, and if I'm spoiling 1990 Total Recall for you, uh, you're watching this now or later. I apologize, but it's old. You know, go watch the movie. I don't think anything's really spoiling. Hey, gamers on games, thanks for sharing. I appreciate it. And you can let them know there's bonus Total Recall talk. So we have a mutation chart for animals. That I've just been kind of rolling up and down. And whoops, uh, mutation generation chart for plants. Which I'm just kind of skipping over because, you know, do we need them all? Now we have mutation. I guess these are mutants. The following list, list of mutations by no means final comprehensive list, but a starting point based on the warden's ship list of Earth creatures brought on board. Oh, I see. So basically they're giving you, giving us a list of, a, a sort of a list of easy to, uh, easy to find mutants if we need them. So here we're finally getting something more approaching a stat block. But not quite. So we get something the hisser. It's kind of interesting because it hasn't told us what they are. Oh, I guess it's next here. So we do get things like unicorns, pegasi, uh, jaggets. So pegasus based on a horse, unicorn also based on a horse, bearoid based on a golden bear, deer, cougaroid, cougars, and we get their how many appear, their armor class. So we do have an armor class. Movement in yards per melee turn. I don't know how long a melee turn is in this case, but basically yards per melee turn. And then their hit dice. So we're seeing some things that we haven't really been told what these things mean. It's, you know, it's one of these things, again, right? We're coming at it from a D&D background. All this stuff makes total sense. But if this was my first RPG, I might be pretty darn confused by this stuff because I don't really know. I mean, I feel like you read armor class, you get it. Oh, okay. You kind of get a sense of what it means. And hit dice, maybe you get a sense of what it means. I'm not sure. Flying types. A changer. This type is able to change its color to match its surroundings. Kind of like Mockingjay type business. I think those, could those change or they just could, maybe the Mockingjays were just more, they could uh, mimic sounds. They were mimic sounds. They were sonic mimics. As precog all the time, like the winged biter. That's a good name. And is resistant to, resistant to all poisons, has a brain too small to be affected by mental attacks. Oh, cheater. Ha <laughs> ha, my brain's too small. And we have see flying types, we get insects. Again, I'm just, I, I guess I'm just fascinated, but here we get the descriptions, but no stat block. Creating non-player creature mutations. Great. Now we're getting into, I'm just going to, we have a list of things to do, but I'm not going to cover them. Might be fun one time to go through. I, you know, for my uh, fill the hexes entry that I've been working on on other streams, I I do need to. I was thinking about having. I mentioned it yesterday, a kind of a magical bomb going off and doing all kinds of stuff. And I also mentioned I don't want to get sidetracked into doing coming up with what the hex area might look like after it's been magical, magically implode or exploded with magical energy. But this is making me think I could use some of these tables to come up with some stuff. Weapons and combat. So okay, so now we have interesting stuff because before they gave us a chart with your these different types of armor and in terms of weapon fire what you need to roll to hit them and it wasn't called armor class and they gave it to us in ranges and they had depending on short range medium long range i guess this is of missile at least of energy type weapons these things but we also get an armor class for it, which is interesting again i might think that if i was doing this now i might want to combine them all into one thing terrence says get your ass to mars would be a great name for an indie rpg I, get on it terrence it would be but that would that be the game terrence is like had to get to mars i mean it'd definitely be an intriguing game of if that was the game was basically building getting all the stuff to build your spaceship or rocket or whatever and, and, and then survive to mars really fascinating depending on how you want to run that kind of game Magnus, you did make it. Welcome aboard. All right, armor class just translates into the stopping power of a player for objects hitting him or her. Everything has an armor class, and this factor must be concealed in battle. Okay, so maybe the other ones were more. So I guess the, yeah, the first thing was called protection. So I guess they're splitting up armor class and protection. So armor class is just the resistance of whatever it is to something hitting it and damaging it, whereas, uh, what did I just say? It was the other one, protection was more stopping these kind of beam-like weapons from hitting. Um, so Jim Ward was a kind of one of the original, uh, I don't know if he was an original player of the games, but he was definitely in that original kind of group. 
of, of kind of Gygax's group. And he created this role-playing game, which is Metamorphosis Alpha, which we're looking at kind of first edition. Also, if you've heard Drawmage, that was based on him. Uh, his, that's his name spelled backwards. If you take Jim Ward, Jim Ward backwards, you get Drawmage, which was you know used as a wizard or for spells and things like what? Drawmage is instant whatever, whatever, whatever. So he's around a long time, worked on Pool of Radiance, which maybe if I have a chance, I'll do some kind of thing with Pool of Radiance because that's great also. Uh, so he was, yeah, so I'm just reading off of his Wikipedia. And it's probably good to do that. I probably should have done this at the start. He was one of the players in Gary Guy, I guess, his early Greyhawk games as uh, D&D was developed. And then, yeah, Drawmage, the character was named after him. It's just his name spelled backwards. He also worked on Gods, Demigods, and Heroes, which I actually have somewhere here. I think I have it. Do I have it in this? Hold on a minute. I have a few white box era books here. Is that one of them? I will let you know in a minute. As my glasses come down over my. Yep, there it is. Gods, Demigods, and Heroes by Prince and Ward. So he worked on that as well. Came out with this Metamorphosis Alpha, maybe the first sci fi RPG. Or I guess, according to Wikipedia, it says it was the first. So there you go. Yep, the original deities and demigods. Hey, Brian Smith. I'm, I'm jealous of the your pool being at the poolside in Florida. Now we're looking at weapons in combat. I'm, I don't know. I'm not that, I, I guess, you know, in terms of this read, I'm not trying to be comprehensive in terms of kind of learning the system per se. Well, I don't know how much I'm going to be getting in here. Does these, what are you rolling here? Rolling chart details. Oh, it's damage. So basically, they are, they're splitting things up again in terms of, so daggers do one to four damage against humanoids, one to four against mutants, oh, and one to four against true humans. But that's, I guess that's not always the case. So it looks like a longbow does one to eight points of damage versus humans or mutated creatures, but true humans, it does one to 12 points. The humanoids being mutated humans and then true humans. The true humans got a break in any of these. So a vibro saw, <laughs> it's grizzly, 15 points of damage against humanoids, 12 against mutated creatures, 18 against true humans. So now the one thing to keep in mind is you, you do have a you do have the potential to start out with quite a lot of hit points as you roll your whatever you roll when you roll your constitution. If you're rolling 3d6, I think. I don't think they actually said the dice you rolled. Maybe they I missed it. So if you have a constitution of 10, let's say, which is average, you'd be rolling 10 D6 to figure out your hit points. So chances are you're going to have between 30 and, say, 60 hit points. So, so you know, you can take you can take a couple of rounds of Vibrosaw. You're not going to like it. Probably take at least one. Not that you'd want to. So we have a bunch of kind of fantasy medieval type weapons in here. Of course, not vibro blades and vibro saws, but you know, flails, maces. Because remember, everything, everyone's been sort of, you've lost tech, you've lost your, most of your technology and stuff. So there are primitive societies living in a starship that they've forgotten how to work. Weapon damage, but you can still pick up, you still have a lot of traces of technology, but you can't, you, you know, I, I think that you're only, you're down to sort of maybe having some Limited knowledge of how to use them, but you don't know how to make them or do anything like that. I don't think. We have some a table of movement rates. So travel with light, standard, or whether you're encumbered. Anti-gravity sled. I wonder if that's kind of similar to that anti-grav part that that robot had. Oh, here we go. Distributions of monsters, in parentheses, mutations, and treasure. As a general rule, in the non-forested areas, there will be more uninhabited space than space occupied. The determination of just where the monsters should be placed and whether or not they will be guarding treasure, useful things, can become burdensome when the referee is faced with several to do at one time. It is a good idea to carefully place some of the best treasures, useful things, with or without guards in hard to find places in one or two of the levels and then add a few random items in the balanced level using a six-sided die. So kind of the same sort of advice you get in the early modules and things like that. Like, uh, was it in, in Search of the Unknown? Is that it? Basically where the 
or you find in something like BX where it will say, hey, place, you know, you want to do a mixture, ideally a mixture of stuff that you've thoughtfully placed, and then you could fill it. So you don't need to thoughtfully place everything. Put the main kind of things you want to place, be thoughtful, place them where it makes sense, and then the context, blah, 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 and then you can use the dice. So in this case, we're rolling a six-sided die, and there's a 33% chance that there's just a monster. There's another 33% chance that there's a monster and a little bit of treasure, which could just be something, something useful, right? And then on a five, which is 16 point, whatever, one in six chance, there's a monster with treasure. And then a one in six chance, there is a stronger monster and good treasure. So I guess you really want the five as the player. You want the five monster and good treasure. Because the other one's very strong monster, but still not, not a very good treasure, just a good treasure. And then treasure can be defined as many things, devices, money. Let's see, furs, which I guess things things that goods basically, and then even could be even knowledge of devices or other things. Note a player cannot shoot a gun on board ship just because he or she can in real life. All right, there's a nice note. So you if you person know how to fire a pistol doesn't mean your character knows how to do it. Taren says, bet you get a lot of fun coming up with weird cargo cult elements the very ship tribals engage in. Yeah, you could totally take this in weird directions. I have not read something like Mothership. I don't know if Mothership takes a lot of inspiration from this, or if it does something totally different. Does Mothership also? Because I don't. I'm not, I know it's sci-fi, but I don't know. Is it supposed to be all on board ship like this, or is it more flying off to do stuff? I don't know. Oh, like the robot-shaped scarecrows. Yeah, you could. You could get really into it with these different. It doesn't seem like that's what they're leaning into here, but you certainly could take it and have get really nitty-gritty. Um, with these, you know, like a tribes without number kind of thing where you could roll some tables and come up with some really interesting, more kind of cultish, strange, strange uh, cultures in here. Oh, okay, Mothership is kind of away team stuff. I got you. Now we have a treasure item list, which I'm not going to read through, but it's kind of a bunch of the stuff we've already seen, seems like, and stuff like roots and berries and sap. Good stuff like that. Let's see, devices, equipment, duels, and weapons. Dual, D-U-A-L, like two, not like I challenge you to a duel. Because the items found or encountered for the first time on the ship are foreign to the character, the ability to properly employ each item should be based on the nature of the item and the intelligence of the finder. Items are listed below by category numbers 1 through 10, with 1 being the most complicated and 10 the least complicated. Items are also listed in four categories according to the danger involved in mishandling them. While there is no separate category of intelligence, it is subsumed in leadership potential. To determine successful uses of an item, simply cross-index the complexity rating of the item against the leadership potential force of the character. The number shown is the score to be made with percentile dice in order to fully util successfully utilize the item. Ooh, complicated. So basically, they want you to be taking a couple things into account, right? To, to figure out how complex it is. And they have a list of 1 to 10, 1 being most complicated 10 being least complicated i'm not sure why they did that in that order um but you've got that and then they have some other bit where you're supposed to kind of check it against their intelligence so here we go complexity level oh this is mental resistance wait a minute is this different than what you were it said the number shown is a score made to percentiles to actually to do it so yeah it, i feel like this might be a mistake because they said it was leadership potential. Unknown. So it looks like, right, the higher your leadership potential, so a one being the most complex, if your leadership potential, I think they put character mental resistance, but I, one of these has to be wrong. It sounds like the text says leadership potential, so maybe that's here instead. But you, if you have less than 10 or less than 11, you simply cannot comprehend it. It is incomprehensible to you. If you're done, if you have 18, it's 65. So it's still pretty tough. Then at 10, it's interesting because at 10, which would be the simplest ones, even if you have an 18, whatever, you still need 20%. So nothing is, uh, nothing is easy. Nothing's easy on board the warden. And then you could have injuries, so they have danger categories, chance to injure yourself or injure others. And then we have then we get on to wandering monsters, quote unquote monsters. We have some charts. 
So if you're doing a 20-sided die, and there are terrain types here, are city, grassland, forest, mountains, lake shores, or swamps. Is there another one? Nope. So we don't have any, so I guess we don't have any um, deserts, unless we're just calling that kind of grasslands. But I don't think so. I don't. I didn't see it mentioned. And it makes sense, too. I mean, it, it would make sense to have deserts from an ecological preservation thing. If you're thinking like these are kind of arc ships, so you'd want to have each of all our major terrains or major environments on earth we'd want to have a bit of desert a bit of whatever but you know it makes sense that in terms of things that will actually help people survive deserts aren't going to be a help um no hills but you know that's probably just because hills you don't really have a separate terrain anyway it's just different elevations and within one of these other types and maybe why would you need a hill i don't know probably don't from a ship standpoint Mountains makes more sense to have than to have just a hill. And we do have wetlands or lake shores. Of course, there's no oceans. Human tribal areas. It has been previously stated that all humans start out in some type of human settlement. These settlements must be set up by the judge and will generally provide most of the things the player needs. All such settlements will be very small population-wise, 100 to 300 humans at most. And in all cases, the humans will be very backward technology-wise. Here is one example of the characteristics of a tribe as outlined by the game judge who creates the basic traits of the tribe and then describes the details briefly around the basic traits he has outlined. Well, as Terrence was talking about, you know, you have some room here. You could potentially get really kind of cultish and strange and weird with these tribes. Let's see what the, what does the example tribe give, to, give for us here? Notice they haven't given us any tables to help us. We're just, you know, at this point, it's, yeah, you come up with what you want. So we have 13 bullet points. The tribe is barely past the root and berry gathering stage, but its members do some hunting. For weapons, the tribe members use bows and arrows and slings. Metal swords and armor are unknown since none exist in the tribe's area. There is a great there is great social equality in the tribe, and females participate in the hunting. The leader of the tribe, shaman, has great abilities, usually 15 to 18 on the dice rolls for game purposes, and has the loyalty of the tribal members. The shaman has a small amount of poison in his possession, which is regarded rather mystically by the tribal followers. Puts the poison on arrows for individual members of the tribe as a show of favor in return for information or devices. That's kind of interesting. Not particularly weird, but interesting. Techno technological devices are mostly unknown, although one man of the tribe has a laser and two power cells for it, which he uses for hunting with great effect. But he will not tell anyone where he got it. A broken-down horticultural robot sits in the center of the tribal village and is an object of curiosity to the tribe. The second strongest human in the tribe is a woman with a singing vine for a follower. The tribe grows plots of corn around the village. The tribe has dogs of several various types, but none of them have tails. Not much is known about areas outside the tribe's village and its environs. Legend, legends told around the campfire discuss other areas that are said to exist to exist far away. The social structure of the tribe is based upon loyalty to the shaman and to other members of the tribe. Violence and quarrels between the members are unusual. Mating of tribal adolescents occurs in a tribal ceremony where a number of such pairings are arranged. This ritual occurs at irregular intervals. And the occasion is marked with a day of rejoicing preceding by a day of solemn rituals. There you go. So, you know, not particularly strange, interesting, or weird, but, you know, you get an idea. I like how you get a little bit of everything in here, probably by design as an example. So you get some social stuff. You get kind of a, a sense of the pecking order. You get a little bit of a motivation. The shaman, who is the, uh, the leader, will pay for some stuff or information, whatever. You got a little bit of like a mystery element with the, the the person who who has the laser rifle. Like, where did they get it from? You know, if you were starting in a village, that might be an interesting first kind of plot hook. It's like, oh, they got a laser rifle. I want a laser rifle. Where did they get it? Maybe I follow them as they go to get another, they have to go get another energy cell. Maybe they, they know something, kind of something like that. Uh, you know, interesting bit, you know, it's written in the 70s. Right, so we got this idea of like, oh, isn't it unique, interesting that the the women and hunt as well as the men, kind of thing. There's you know, a little bit of that, but you know, the strongest person in the tribe is also a woman. Interesting, maybe because of that, at least in the '70s, but now maybe more interesting because she's got a singing vine as a follower, which seems to be unique to that individual. That no one else has it. Maybe not even the shaman has that, but she's she's got. It. Magnus asks if the setting here is like a generation ship or some sort of Dyson structure. Generation ship, you nailed it. Magnus, that is exactly what it is. But uh, everything has gone wrong. Um, radiation, passing through a radiation cloud, caused everything to go kaplooey, and then some amount of generations later, the ship is floating around, and everyone is kind of devolved back to a sort of somewhere, you know, primitive to probably 
medieval level of, you know, fantasy medieval level of technology with odds and ends, people learning how to use some things, but no one really knowing how to make stuff. It's more you're salvaging stuff from these areas of the ship. We have forested areas. We've got time. As the game gets into full swing, it is likely that various players and groups will be adventuring in every direction and at different time periods. It is suggested that the referee keep an accurate record of each player, and you should also moderate the passive time as well, keeping the time aspect in proper and accurate perspective. So a little bit of that same, like, you know, you need to, you need to, what did Gygax say in the first edition D &D, uh, DMG, right, about accurate time? We're going to need that too. So clearly what they're saying here, it's not really spelled out. And I wonder if this goes back to that two to 12 or two to 24 players is that remember we're thinking back to this is 1976 that the main way that people are engaging with D and D with this game are in these kind of uh, groups in which you have lots of players, potentially lots of GMs and you're running games, different times, different players. Different, so you're not necessarily running a group of 24 at this moment, maybe, but maybe you have, Oh, these three people went out to do this. These four do want to do that. Then another, right. And so you have to keep track of positioning of where all these, different players are at time. It's really fascinating. I'd love to see if there was to do that in this kind of thing. Like, like in any kind of shared setting where you have all these different groups operating in different areas on the same ship, maybe on different levels, doing different things. So you want to keep track of time because time is otherwise, if you have people on the same level, the same area, doing different things, it's going to lose coherence. So keep track of time. Keep track of time. All right. Now what do we have? The main ship's computer. Okay. That's, Great non-player characters. We get a morale with loyalty score, 3d6. Three, they're going to desert. First chance they get. 15, 18, they, they're they stalwart followers. Right, it could be a gaming club setting. Yep. Relatives, when a player character dies, it is logical to assume that someone will get his possessions. The referee, in a number of ways, depending on the situation, can handle this. You could have a relative or a follower. You know, it's basically kind of your... PC replacement sort of thing. Healing of body damage. When a player or another character suffers damage which results in loss of accumulated hit points, it is necessary for that injured being to rest and regain those lost hit points. Points can generally be regained at the rate of one point per day of rest, which means the player undertakes no extensive traveling or strenuous activity. A judge can adjust the rate according to its discretion if desired, depending on the type of wound and the situation. So we're seeing in like 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 a like um yeah, I think BX is pretty similar, like OD and D, right? Your rate of healing is slow. But I think the reason they can have it be so slow, I think there's, again, it's not explained, but I think there is an assumption that you have other characters that you could play in the interim. So, oh, my character Fred has been laid out and he's going to need three weeks of rest. So remember, because I'm keeping track of time and everything, great. So he's going to be back at the village. He's going to be recuperating for 18 days. And in the interim, I'm going to take my other character, Josiah, and he's going to go out and do stuff whatever or you know and then time between sessions whatever so you can have these low rates of healing because i think the expectation is there's kind of a roster of things going on and that this the player even though their character's out of commission the player will be fairly easily be able to continue playing or doing something and it's not everyone sitting twiddling their thumbs either skipping forward three weeks or twiddling the thumbs, you know assuming no one has kind of healing abilities items powers whatever you know, again, in a more modern game where we're looking at and we just have our group of three, four, five players who are playing, this is probably where you, we, I think it would be okay to say, let's juice up the healing a bit, change it up a bit to make it a little bit less like, man, we just went the dungeon once and now we got to rest for three weeks. Or in this case, there's, I don't know if there's, I mean, there are areas I'm sure that are dungeon like, but they haven't, I don't think they've used the actual term dungeon. It seems like a lot of stuff is not particularly like going underground so much as going into engineering type sections or places outside of the 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 natural habitats, artificial though they may be. They have languages. Because so many of the shipboard mutations use telepathy, a common language has evolved among all species speaking species on the starship. This language is closely related to human speech. There you go. So we have a surprise. Let's see. It's usually a one to two, so same as your kind of D and D normal means of exchange. Prior to the disaster, the basic monetary unit used on board the ship was the domar, a small, lightweight plastic type of coin that was indestructible or reasonably so, given the technology of the time. 
Still, since all normal functions were provided on shipboard, there was no need for money as such. So the domar was not widely used, except for gambling and other such diversions. The idea of wealth or poverty was were unknown, since all the inhabitants of the ship shared equally in its provisions for life and leisure on shipboard. In the alteration of life that occurred in the radiation disaster, the inhabitants and their descendants have been reduced to a lower form of existence where survival is the key. As such, inequalities have arisen and possessions have taken on importance. In the current time, domars exist and are accorded value by those inhabitants who handle and trade with them. Still, since they were never in great numbers, domars are in short supply. Accordingly, the use of, bar of the barter and trade method of dealing has developed to a large degree. There you go. Here's just a jawed plant illustration. Whoops. All right, shall I read the example? I suppose I shall. Example of a referee moderating the adventure. I guess just funny thing is that's all they had to say on that. All right, you can still do domars, but people barter. I don't think we've given, we no, no list of values or what it means. It would even be nice that this is coming out from TSR, who is already at this point, Dungeons and Dragons is out, and I presume is doing well, to put like, here's a list of, you know, if you're thinking gold pieces, gold pieces to domars, or domar would be equivalent to a gold piece, like, you know. No, and, and they haven't jammed in that. And if you want to do even more fantastic stuff, then check out the D&D white box. Available from fine retailers now. Okay, so his, this example illustrates a portion of a sample adventure aboard the ship to the city section level. Players are all human, <clears throat> equipped and ready, and are starting from the main ship's elevator, as one of them has a brown color band. All of them are armed. We still haven't seen how you gain color bands or how that comes about, or maybe you just have to find them. Don't know yet. All of them are armed with swords, weapon class 3, and are wearing heavy furs, armor class 7, for protection. The referee's part is represented as R, that of the caller, player representing the group is known as a C. So remember the caller system, if you recall, was this idea, and I think some folks still use it, and I think it has some benefits, especially with large groups, that basically one person is going to be representing the group. So instead of at every intersection asking around eight people, what do you do? The caller would basically call out, okay, player one's doing this, player two's doing this, we're all doing that kind of thing. Uh, I've never been in, in a group that used the caller. I, that's something I'd like to try. <clears throat> or maybe I could, you know, if I was at a con, I would, if I was at a con, I saw a game with a collar, I definitely would stop and watch it. I've heard good things about how it worked, uh, but it's kind of a little bit, I feel like people think it's a little bit antithetical to the way people play now, because you do have at some point is at least for portions of the game, one player is kind of determined saying what the other players are doing, player characters, but, you know, that's how that works. Hey, Kabuki Kid, good luck on your appointment and thanks for hanging out. All right, so we pick it up with the referee. The elevator opens up to an expansive corridor over a mile wide, going in the direction of what would be the ship's north. The caller says, since it's impossible for us to see both sides of the corridor, we'll go to the east side of this one and look all around for signs of movement or any open doors. The referee consults his master map and plots the group's movement in the desired direction. The group awaits the referee's word on the result of their decision. The referee says, after walking for ten, about 10 minutes, you arrive at the side of the corridor and see several piles of white dust and an open door. Looking down the corridor, you see many doors, some open and some closed. About every 50 meters is a door with a small box-like thing about four feet up along the wall besides the doors. The caller momentarily consults with the other players on what the group should do. Several courses of action are suggested and argued very briefly, including one player's urging to head elsewhere. <laughs> I got a bad feeling about this. But in a minute, the group has reached a consensus to try the first door. Caller says, we'll go to the first open door, look in, and check this box-like thing. The referee says, who's going in the room first, and who will check the box? Caller says, Zendor and Carob will enter the room together, and I'll check out the main box myself, but just by looking at it first. The referee says, okay. The light comes on in the room. The referee knows that the light was triggered by the ship's computer, but the players do not know that, and the referee gives them no indication of it. You see furniture around and a big screen on one wall. Uh, the caller says, what about the box? The referee says, well, the only thing you can notice is that the exterior has one small indentation as there's tiny lines in that indentation. The caller says, does it look like my finger? The referee says, yes, the marks look like a fingerprint. The caller says, okay, we'll ignore the box for a minute. As have everybody enter the room and put Lukash guarding the doorway. Yeah, Lukash! The referee says, all right, everybody's in the room, now what? The caller says, well, how big is the room? The referee says, the room is about 30, 30 meters wide both north and south and east and west. The door you came in is in the northeast corner of the room. The big screen is in the middle of the east wall. Near the southwest corner is a small door, and there is another larger door in the middle of the south wall. 
caller asks, is there anything else in the room? If the caller doesn't ask for anything more, the referee does not have to reveal further information. The extent of the player's observations and their thoroughness depend on their question. I mean, this is a big, I love this slide. <laughs> this is an example. This is like, like a big thing, I think, of the ethos. I'm kind of old for this call. Right, so the, the caller, if the caller doesn't ask for more, the referee doesn't have to reveal more. So the idea here is really putting on the players this responsibility of ask about your surroundings. It, this is almost an answer to the question of what if I didn't ask, was the referee supposed to have told me X, Y, or Z? And here they're saying clearly, whoops, no. You, it is up to you, the player, to ask about things. If if the referee, if you're thinking there seems to be a gap in the information, ask to fill the gap. Hey, Raptor Jesus. Raptor Jesus says they've been recreating the warden in Worldographer, mostly just to get some practice using it. It's a really cool setting, but never got to play with the group. That'd be really cool if you share your map somewhere. I'd love to see it whenever it's done. I, it does seem like a really cool setting. Yeah, I was late to discovering Metamorphosis Alpha. I mean, I was too young for at least in its early incarnations, and then I was late getting it. But it has a lot of really fun stuff in it. Okay, so now the ref answering to the question of the caller asks, is there anything else? The referee says, yes. There are several chests of drawers in the room, one with four drawers and one with three drawers. I will say, chests of drawers seem large enough that I probably would put that, like the, the art, I think the fine art in this balance of, of what is upon the players and what's on the GM or the referee Something like a big, like chest of drawers, I feel like probably should have been in the main room description. Whereas maybe counting the number of drawers, some other detail element is maybe not as important. There's a line there, right? You want to stand line. If don't, I don't think it should be like super vague and expect the players to fill in every, keep asking and asking. You know, it's a room. What's in the room? Furniture. What type? Like you know, give that up. But I think that I do agree that there's at some point where it really behooves the players to be active. And not just expect feeded, being fed to them. But, you know, I think chest of drawers, I think multiple things like drawers like that are large enough that maybe would have been a mention. I don't know, but obviously they feel differently. This referee in particular. The caller again consults with the players on what course of action they will take. One player wants to whack at the big screen with a sword, but the rest seem more interested in the chest. Uh, I wonder if that player is like a doing what their character would want to do. Because really, you want to whack at the screen? After a moment, they decide to open them up for examination of the contest. The chest, that is, not the screen. The caller says, okay, we'll open up the big chest. The referee says, who's going to open it? The caller consults with the others, the players. The player playing Carob volunteers. Carob will open it, starting with the top drawer. The referee asks if anyone's helping them. The caller says, no, not unless it does not want to open. The rest of us will stand back away. <laughs> the referee rolls a number of dice, first to determine if Carob has difficulty opening the drawer, then for the effects of the contents inside. After finishing the rolls, he announces the results or the results discernible to the players. Ah, oh, that's a key point. Raptor says, Jesus says they do post on the Reddit OSR, so he's playing a throw it up there. Ah, yes. Ah, oh, he didn't get to finish it. Yeah. Well, you should definitely put it up there now. Unfortunately, I'm not unfortunately, but, you know, it probably will actually get more notice now than it would have before just because of what's happened. But, yeah, it, which, which kind of stinks, but that's the way people work. But. Yeah, definitely, definitely put it up and post it in multiple places because there are folks like me that don't, I've kind of given up on Reddit. Though, you know, Raptor Jesus, actually, I would be careful with Reddit because I don't know if you've read the news. And I'm not trying to go off on other tangents, but Reddit, I don't know if they've the deal's gone through yet, but as part of Reddit's going public strategy, they're essentially selling all their stuff for um, making deals to license their content for AI. And I don't know how that works with stuff you've posted. I don't know if it's just on written content as opposed to images, but if you're posting it onto OS, to Reddit, just be aware that somewhere down the line, sometime down the line, maybe soon, maybe not, maybe further away, uh, you're basically giving it to them for AI to the highest, you know, whatever. So that would give me pause. Maybe what I would do instead is post it somewhere else and then link and post the link to Reddit. But, you know, just be, be careful because I don't know how it's going to shake out, but Something's going on. It is, it is, it is very lame. Okay, so let's see. So, okay, we see the referee rolled number of dice and then says, Carob opens the door with ease. Then, however, he suddenly screams as the door opens and falls to the floor. The 
You all notice a strange glow from the door he opened. The referee pauses, awaiting the response of the players and noting their quickness in acting in face of the sudden danger. He has already rolled for Carob, who succumbed to the intensity of the radiation level of some object within the drawer. The caller says, radiation, it must be. We'll get out of the room right away. So wait a minute, is Carob dead? Carob succumbed to the intensity of the radiation level. Wow. Oh my gosh. There you go, Carobs. We hardly knew you, Carob. Tip of the cap to you. The other players quickly agree the referee rolls dice to determine if the radiation has any other effect, but the players are fortunate to escape its effects in time, partly due to the fact that they were not as close as the unlucky Carob. And so the players leave the room and travel onward towards what strange fate they do not know. All right. So, poor Carob's gone, but not forgotten. Now we get a sample example city level. Example of a level, rather, that is a city section. So we get an, a map here. Notice we're squares. I know they mentioned having hex paper for maps, but here we're using squares. Let's see. So we have the key. We have a medical area, detention area, a bachelor dwelling area, a family dwelling area, a schools area, a recreation area, the main elevator, a ramp. They're calling an inclined plane. I don't know why they just don't call it a ramp, but whatever, inclined plane. Entertainment areas, some dining areas, areas, office areas, rural village, which is where's 12, where's 12? Over, oh, over here. A country, some country villas, forest and lakes of various size, human tribal areas here. Uh, and then some radiation areas with an intensity noted by a number, which would be what R. Oh, I see R four. There you go. And we don't know how big these. Oh, each square is two miles. These are two miles, two square miles. And then we have some. We have some. I don't know if I need the descriptions of the areas. I wonder what these are with the cracked stuff. What is that? Well, it says bachelor area, but no, I don't think that's. Are they? Oh, I guess they're supposed to be streets. Maybe these are. Maybe it's just kind of a. Because it's supposed to be a city. Each square is two miles, so I guess these are just kind of the. Because I, I was wondering, is these web works? Like, what's going on? Is there giant spiders in the place? But yeah, as uh, someone that was Raptor Jesus says, think they're roadways. I would agree with you. Now we have a, let's see, another ship's level 11 map. This one's in hexes. That's weird. Why have one in squares and one in hexes? Does that make sense to anybody else? I guess it just shows, use whichever one you want. I, I'm guessing the reason why this one is squares is because the main thing is the city and they want to do blocks. So for this, that makes sense. Whereas here, we're outdoors, more or less. So, hexes make sense, but that's weird. I, mean, I would just just have put a square in the. I don't know. Doctor Jesus says they were very confused, but I think it was more of a stylistic choice than practical. I don't. I, I'm I'm guessing. I, I really think it's kind of like if this one, if it's most, if it's pretty much outdoors, it's going to be hexes. If it has kind of an indoor or thing element, man-made element, I think it's going to be squares. That's my guess. But it is weird. So we've got the elevator. Oh, the elevator, I see. So there's your elevator in the middle. We have an inclined plane. Again, I think, isn't that just a slope? But all right. This is a hill. So we do have hills that are just not marked out as terrain. So this is a hill. And interestingly, they just don't use an elevation type dashed line, but. That's just how they do it, I guess. And we have mountains. Uh, is there a mountain area? I guess. Wait a minute. Is this mountain? Are we on a mountain? Are we surrounded by mountains? So I guess these are mountains. Hex is surrounding. And then we got lines. Elevation. What's this? And then radiated radiated areas have the lines because yeah, they, they, you have to kind of learn. There's definitely going to, if you've looked at other kind of outdoors maps, you might look at like this area around 12 and you might think 
it's hills because often certain kinds of maps you'll see that his hills but that's actually radiation and then the hill is this element here is a hill and then i guess mountainous terrain is all around but and it's interesting because they've got stuff obviously creeps up the slope but then with the shading it makes it really hard to see some of the stuff but i'm guessing this is forest that's up on the mountain slope and then i don't know interesting interesting and the style is interesting too right they're not using this is more of that top down i always think of my first impulse thing of like a civil war kind of map type thing where it's showing the as if you're looking down for a typography then classic say like outdoor survival kind of hex map or with the symbology of here is a mountain here is a hill maybe i, I think probably because just the right we're only dealing with two mile hexes so Maybe that's why. And let's see, we've got some wolfoids, a storage area, some hawkoids, hissers, winged biters, piercers, baroids, human settlement, which is, where's H? Uh, where is H? M E T. Oh, there's H. How did they number these or letter these? A, and then it goes to N. Interesting. Some shocker beasts, an imitator, some small warriors, small warriors, a nest of small warriors. That must be a, cr a creature that's called a small warrior. There's a security bot. There's a lone human female. Eight teens in all categories. Holy cow. She possesses a protein disruptor pistol. She has a winged biter for a pet and is served by a sword bush, sword bush, sword, sword bush. That response to her every command. She wishes only to be left alone and will not cooperate with other beings. Well, that's kind of like a hermit. Leave her alone. Uh, does anyone know if isometric hex graph paper is a thing? I know there's isometric paper, but I don't know, which I think makes hexes. I'm not totally sure. I'm not sure. Hey, Perkins. This is indeed a throwback to olden times. Are we at the end? No. We suddenly got... <laughs> Metamorphosis Alpha is uh, any question. Well, first again, any question on these rules should be directed to TSR. Close a self-addressed stamped envelope. Everybody remember that? Do you, everyone remember? Well, if you're old, like, you definitely have a certain age if you remember the, uh, having to having to keep self-addressed, having to do self-addressed stamped envelopes. Credits designed by James Ward, developed by Brian Bloom, editing by Mike Carr and David Sutherland, artwork by David Sutherland. Special thanks to Gary Gygax. And this was converted to PDF by Craig J. Brain with more proofreading and errata from the members of the official Metamorphosis Alpha Forum. No links. Come on, guys. Put some links in here. Here we're getting a, what is this? Let me can zoom out now. A modular dwelling diagram. After Jesus says, it's funny that the way Jim designed it was a lot like a video game, but it kind of predates those kinds of games. I wonder if somewhere along the line, someone has, in the industry got inspired by this. Yeah, it's a good point. I don't know. But yeah, it does definitely have a, a video game kind of feel to it. Clarence says, this reminds them they just got a copy of Cepheus Deluxe in the mail. Oh, nice. Is, is that from the new Kickstarter? Or is there an, isn't there another Kickstarter they're doing Cepheus? Or is that, or is that sort of Cepheus? Is that the same? I, I'm not up on the Cepheus terminology. Oh, Magnus has a cool idea for the hex jam, but hard to conceptualize in 2D. Seems all the more reason you should try it. But I, I can't help you, unfortunately, off the top of my head. And then we have an A frame, modular forms. We've got, now we have the, the a slice through the warden. A little bit of a Star trek -y kind of thing there. I guess that's an engine system. And then we got the slices with all the different decks. We get your character sheet. Oh, one for, oh, so it's basically only takes half a piece of paper. One, One's for mutants, one's for humans. And we get, what is this? Just an illustration. Bang, this says, imagine a Lovecraftian-esque adventure where the maddening artifact is just a pre-internet source book that somehow has links in it. That would be funny. Well, this <laughs> PDF's not that old, but yeah, that would be good. We have some movement tables. We have an encounter table. We got, oh, because we're into the charts part, and we have an errata sheet, which I'm not going to bother with, but if you need it, we've got it. I'm surprised they didn't just, I guess probably they just added this thing, because I figured, like, why not just fix it? But I guess 
It is what it is. Weapons of combat. And then, oh, what's this? The Awakening. What is this? So this is an... The Awakening is an introductory adventure for the first edition of Metamorphosis Alpha. The reader needs to know that when they created this game, the role-playing game industry was in its infancy. The only wish they had the foresight to have created an adventure for the game in 1974 when the game was written. With this edition, I present something that will work for anyone wanting to use these rules. Cool. I'm going to leave it. I'm not going to do it, but we've got... Uh, I'm going to leave this. Folks can discover this if they grab the book. We have a blank. Oh, see, look at that. It all takes place on one page. Basically, you have a hex hex map. And we get the back. Well, that was Metamorphosis Alpha. I wish it didn't take something, uh, you know, someone's passing to uh, to, to bring it back up. Like I said, I've, I've owned... I've owned uh, I've owned the book for a while, well, for quite a while, but uh, and I've read it, you know, off and on. I love the I love the mutant stuff. I always wanted to do something with the the kind of mutations and things. Maybe I'll do something with it. With this, my fill the hexes entry. It's a fun read. It's kind of amazing. There's a lot of it that feels kind of unsaid <laughs> uh, in here, and it's interesting how it's it's written in a way that really makes you feel like you're if you're coming at this, you're kind of coming at this. From having had some experience with DD, I can't imagine if this was my first role playing game. I feel like I would be lost because it, it's it's slim and trim. It's only thirty some odd pages, though the type is very small. Like I said, it's it, the size wise, it's kind of very similar. Here's like the judges judges guild ready reference sheets, kind of for just for scale purposes. It feels like it's about the same kind of deal, maybe plus or minus a little bit. So very dense. The layout's very interesting. I, the the setting is great, and the concept is great. I'd be curious to see. No one's really. I don't think this is one that's gotten kind of a retro clone thing. Someone's has anyone retro cloned it? I don't know if anyone has. Maybe somebody should just kind of clean it up and maybe give a little bit more information. I just can't imagine trying to design my own show. I mean, he's, he, you know, he, I, someone mentioned. I may have been Terrence saying that. Uh, you know, you end up, everyone played with the warden instead of making their own ship. It's like, yeah, because that's hard. Just even having the different hex papers and doing <laughs> hex papers for some square, you know, like it's, it's difficult. Or, or you could just play with what's already here in the book. Like, I totally get why people would have been like, yep, I'm going to use it in the book because I might not have hex paper. And even though there is a blank hex sheet, uh, you know, you got to take that to your library and print out a bunch of copies, which I'm sure people did. Still, it's like, you know, I could just probably just play with what we have here. Um, let's see. Perkins says, oh, replying to Magnus, that the city of Sigil is toroid, and they created a poster map. Oh, interesting. Raptor Jesus says, I've been wondering where I would start a campaign since the first few levels are cargo, but it's like a 24-mile cargo hold. It would be huge for a group of adventurers walking. Yeah, I think what you'd want to do is, I believe you, I think the idea is you start in one of the, well, I think he says straight up, you start in one of the villages. So you would start, let's, yeah, let's you would start one of the tribal areas so, like you, I, I think I think this a map like this is where I would probably start. And I think they there is a human settlement. So H, so right there. Oops, that's probably where I would start. So you can get to the main elevator. You actually got a bunch of things you could kind of do a hex crawl. You could adventure a lot without ever leaving this area. Uh, and and I guess. The mountains is interesting because I guess what I don't know what happens if you what's a J, an image here lives in this area and changes to copy anyone that comes out of the out of the inclined plane. In the night, it attempts to take over the person of its choice after using a blowgun with a poison dart. Intensity eighteen, whoo, 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 whoo. nasty. Um, so I would start here. You know, and and I don't know they again things that are not explained. Do we know how to operate the elevator? Do you need a key? Do you need one of those bands? Because again, also not explained is who has a band? Can you get a band? I might have missed it because I, I remember I wasn't. I was kind of skimming along, but there's a lot that's we don't know. But it does give you, you know, opportunity as a GM to referee to play with that stuff. Like, okay, you need to get a band. Do you have a band? No, you need to get a band. You're not going to even get to the elevator to the band. So the first adventure could really be you need to get at least one band that gives us access to the elevator. And then of course you got all this stuff going on in here. 
We're not even including any kind of wandering creatures, that kind of thing. There's a lot of venturing, but that's probably where I would start. And then it could be then with the cargo areas. I don't know if they're empty or there's security robots, but you probably, I would probably want to post posit that those or the setup would probably be that those are very deadly and difficult. You want to kind of get really well armed and you want to go in, grab something and leave and not be going, hanging around in there. That's kind of how I would probably put those, but they had that, but it is where you can, you know, it's kind of, they don't mention the word dungeon in here that I can tell, but those areas I think are kind of your dungeon areas where you're having, I mean, they don't say in their example of play, they didn't say where they were or did they, did they say in the example where they were? Oh, they're in a city level. Because the city level also feels very dungeony as well. Arkansas gives them silent running vibes. Yeah, you could do a, a lot of different things. Or or if you're thinking about kind of a Star Trek holodeck, Star Trek Next Generation sort of holodeck kind of episode, but holodecks kind of run wild sort of thing or something weird like that. But yeah, you can, there's there's a lot. There's a lot going on. But I would definitely start in one of these levels kind of ease into it, ease into things a little bit, and then kind of work towards, and then look, it could be with the right, you put the right things around it that there's, you don't ever go to the cargo holds because that's not the kind of things that your players are interested in. You know, they're more interested in the stuff with these different cultures and different things or trying to do, you know, whatever. I don't know. Yep, you could definitely go a long time. So this was Metamorphosis Alpha, a really great Great read, really fun. Like I said, it's uh, it's. I, I think that we're really, you know, these older books. It's such an advantage to come at them from now because we have so much information and access and experience with the game and different. Even even if you've never played, say, O D and D, or even read it, just knowing something about D and D, you gotta know things that I think a first time reader would struggle with because they don't explain it anywhere. I don't think he really, I mean, he explains basically what some of the stuff is, but other stuff doesn't seem to really explain it too much. Like I said, I might have missed some of it, but they're kind of just dropping you in. Oh, yeah, just create your own game. It's like, what? I've never, I, don't even, I barely know what a role playing game is. I'm supposed to create my own thing, you know, but now coming at it from our angle, it's like, okay, yeah, we get what we get what we're doing. Uh, and so, in some ways, it's kind of funny because it's, it's in some ways, it's more, more written for a, at a time where folks who are more likely to get it are going to be really interested and invested and knowledgeable in role-playing games of all sorts than back then when it might have been the first potentially I, I mean i don't know how widely uh released it was and we'll probably have to look at we'll look at gamma world at some point maybe they add in some of the more intro-y kind of stuff like here let's hold your hand a little bit more because this one don't do it uh and and maybe really at that point they would have said that look when we put out metaphors alpha we were just we were really marketing towards D D folks at that point right three years or whatever since the game had come out or two two or three years since the game had come out and now it's many audience so they felt like they were preaching to people who were already heavily invested but it's fun it is fun all right now we're just over two hours so i guess this is as good a place as any to call it i might stream again later depending uh because i do i need to, i feel like i need to get work done on my fill the hexes jam but we will see but this was a lot of fun um you know Rest in peace to James Ward. I know, you know, as a Gamers on Games who was in here earlier, at least, you know, mentioned he's got a kind of a complicated uh, history. I didn't even, I did not know about that when I started the stream. Uh, so I'm not meaning to, obviously I'm not doing this to to highlight the stuff that he may have done that was not great. I have to, I'll have to read up on it. I'll try to add some notes in if there's something I feel like needs to be known. But I, you know, celebrate the, celebrate the positives that he contributed. And this is certainly one of those. So. It was a great read. Thanks so much for hanging out. Perkins says that uh, science and fantasy matchup was a normal thing back in the 70s. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's all kinds of great stuff in those matchups. Uh, thanks so much for hanging out. You may see me later today, otherwise tomorrow or whenever. But have a great rest of your day, night, whenever you end up watching or streaming this. Game on. Every, yeah, game on, everybody. And I will talk to you later. Bye now.